when we began this trial, the first thing I think I said to you was that the defendant is not guilty of this offense, and we talked about that presumption of innocence. Uh, he's now been stripped of that. Uh, the burden of proof, we talked about the burden of proof, and, and here's the burden of proof, there's the burden of proof, and the witnesses that you heard from are the burden of proof. And sometimes you might question that along the way about, okay, why is Alan Merritt, have you already told us that Alan Merritt saw Scuff's some offense, but that evidence hasn't come in through, these, through the witness statement. And, and I know it's been lengthy, and you, you've heard a lot of facts, and heard a lot of things in this case, and a lot of lies. You've heard, uh, and one of the things that I asked you at the beginning of voir dire, one of the things that we talked about was using common sense. That's all this case comes down to, is using your common sense, and also listening to the instructions of what the judge will tell you about sympathy and prejudice that you're not to use any. Because the burden of proof in this case and the witnesses that we call, when you look back on what, what you really heard in this case, you, we started out, you heard from the Walker family, right? You heard from Jill Walker, Evan Walker, Mark Walker, and they are crushed. They're crushed with the loss of a spirit that was like sunshine to them. She was strong-willed, she was sassy, she was sarcastic sometimes, but she was their light. And they're blessed that they got 16 years with her. And they can look at it that way and live the rest of their lives knowing at least we got that. But they'll be always be muted. You could sense that from them when they took the stand. Each one of them has suffered a loss at the hands of him. This guy his personal responsibility, his actions, everything that he did caused them to suffer and every person in here who she touched in their lives will never be the same again because of him and his selfishness and his lies and his possessiveness and his manipulation and his obsessiveness of Emma Walker. Mark and Jill and Evan, well, they won't be the same. They are crushed. <laughs> but you can write that by getting justice for Evan in this case. You also heard from John and Karen Warren and Jill Carney. They put time frames on things for you in this case. John and Karen Warren told you at 3 o'clock in the morning. Luckily, they were awake and they heard the gunshots. But if you got a sense of John Warren, you also got a sense of loss from him too. When you thought, when you, when you when you saw the anguish that that guy had, a neighbor, just a neighbor, and the guilt that he felt that this person creeped into the middle of his neighborhood at three o'clock in the morning, wearing all black with a gun. You think John Warren, if he'd have caught him, would he have squeezed the life out of him? Creeping into a little girl's backyard. Imagine that. Survivors of a neighbor. Just imagine the anguish they feel when you saw that coming to a neighbor. And you heard from Sarah Seaton's and all, all the people that attended Sarah Seaton's party, Keegan Lyle. Uh, you heard from Max Bacon, Zach Green, Haley McDonald. What they all tell you. just like the Walkers did. They didn't want him around her. They didn't like him. He was possessive. He was manipulative. He was controlling. He was toxic to her. Just like the Walkers. You're not wanted around here anymore. And none of her friends did either. But the important thing that they did tell you too is that that Friday night, he's harassing her. She's upset. She's uncontrollable to some witnesses. By his actions, creating this fictitious, this bogus kidnapping story to upset her. Staged only to upset her. Haley McDonald tells you how that continued into the next day. And how she sees him. She knows him. I stood right here 
And the heavenly said, we were about this far apart. I know it's him. I know his person. I know his gait. I know how he carries himself. It was what made me as, as the man in black. And I saw his car. I was a little stumped because one of the stickers was different than what I remember it. But as soon as she saw the picture, which you'll see in the record, is the same picture that was taken by, by the Knox County Sheriff's Office at Cooper Athletic Center with that sticker removed. And that's the car. Yeah. And you also hear, of course, that he's caught with the suit, right? When he's finally arrested, he's caught with the black suit. The suit that he's wearing is the man in black. And why does he want, why is it so important? Why is he questioning so badly the witnesses to try and make you think like he's not the man in black? We'll get to that here in a second, but there's a reason why he's okay with saying I'm the kidnapper, but not okay with the man in black. And we'll talk about that. You heard about his alibi to Haley. Remember those things when, when, when Haley says, Why are you in Sturkey? I'm not. I'm my grandfather's wife. I'm not, I swear I'm not. The old would be thanked out of protested too much. Why does he protest? And he offers an alibi. I've been with Noah all morning. No, no, he hasn't. Noah told you he woke up at 11. Riley had been gone. I had breakfast with my stepdad, Seth Donalon, this morning. Seth Donalon got on the stand and told you, well, you know, I don't remember eating with Riley, and by golly, I, gave, I sent a text to him that night at 7 o'clock saying, how are things been going? Which, if I didn't breakfast with him, you know what? I wouldn't have sent him that text. So, probably I didn't eat breakfast with him. He doesn't even, I can't even keep his alibi straight. You hear from David Wise? Sheriff's Department uh, deputy who'd known Riley since he was little. And where, what does Riley do? Deny, deny, deny. Just like he's always done. Deny everything. And just as David Wise is getting ready to leave, and everybody thinks at this point, remember, it's a suicide, David Wise will tell you. And Riley calls him back in and says, hey, i got to tell you about something. I could tell you about this man in black that was harassing her, shifting responsibility, shifting blame to somebody else. That's what this whole weekend was a setup for. He set the whole weekend up to shift responsibility to somebody else to say there's this nefarious clandestine organization that's out there trying to get me and Emma through the kidnapping story, through the man in black story, the homicide and murder of that 16-year-old girl when she slept. And David Wise, he had his opportunity, right? When David Wise, a trusted friend, questioned him about that, and David Wise said, what, what, the, a guy creeping around? That just doesn't sound right to an investigator you know, if he didn't know something about it. And then we got to Jim Walker. You heard from Jim Walker, what? If there's somebody secondarily broken in this case to the Walker family, it's the Walker family, it's Jim Walker. Uh -oh. He's broken. He is somebody who has been crushed by his actions, his own grandson. But one thing he wasn't going to do is come in here and lie. He came in here and told you. Yep. The gun is missing. Yep, I never take it out of the holster. Yeah, I knew. Did he know what Riley had taken it? Pretty much. You think about the fact that what his initial thing was, that what did he do? He dispatched Ashley, his daughter, his stepdaughter, Ashley, the defendant's mother, to go and search his, his dorm room. Why would you do that if you didn't believe him? Because this, this web of lies that this person has been leading is constant. It's a constant drumbeat on this family. Jim Walker, you could tell, was exasperated with his conduct. Ashley Donalon, his mother, 
Think about that jail call that you heard and you think about the exasperation in a mother's voice when he tells her, uh, I found Papa's gun. Riley, what? Riley, if you could, you, it was almost palpable. You could feel in her voice the anguish and the saying, so sick of this. I'm sick of the lies. But he turned that house upside down, Jim Walker did. He did everything he could. But he knew that gun didn't come out of the holster ever. And so he knew. I think probably in his heart you could tell that he hoped that some Maryville College kid had stolen it and was going to prank it or something. In his heart he hoped that Riley wasn't the thief, but he knew. And Seth Donalon, we talked about him. He had no idea that he's hiding the murder weapon in his basement. But Seth, too, was not going to come in here and lie for the defendant. And he told you he wasn't going to cover for him about the Saturday morning alibi. No, I wasn't there for breakfast with him. And then we got to Isaac, Noah, and Alex, his best friends. And think about what they told you in terms of the weekend and the, and the bizarre nature of the things that were happening. And we think about the nature of the bizarre actions that he engaged in, it all began when he stole that gun. Everything started to whirlwind as soon as he got that gun in his hands. Right? Friday afternoon, Jim Walker, gun is missing. Riley, where's the gun? I don't have it, Papa. Deny, deny, deny. And then comes the kidnapping story. Why is that? Because now he's armed with a weapon and now if he can create this alternative group that is after Emma and he actually does the attack, he can blame it on somebody else. That's what Friday night's about. You think about the text communication, come outside alone. Come outside alone. That's how it starts. You think if Emma Walker had walked outside alone and had gone to the end of the driveway on Taswell Pike and gotten into the car with him, him armed with a weapon, because you know he's got the gun at that point, and if she had talked to him cruel, that she might have been let out into a field at gun. Would she have died Saturday if she'd opened the door? His efforts, every, every single instance, were to get her alone. And it wasn't working. She was refuting him. She was sending him away. And what did Isaac and, and Noah and Alex, you know, the heroes in this case, they're the Achilles heel in his plan because his plan was to get away with this. His plan was never to be caught. And but for the intervention of Alex and Noah and Isaac and telling the authorities about the gun and his plan to ditch the gun, he could have. He could have. And more importantly, what did Isaac tell you? His best friends in second grade, right? Who knows him more than anybody else in this courtroom and testify to this in front of you is Isaac Ewers. Isaac told you he lied constantly. Told you he fakes his suicide stuff to get attention. And more importantly, he told you that he was ramping up to violence. He saw it coming. He knew his friend and he knew that his activity and his behavior was ramping up towards and he wasn't surprised that he killed Emma. He saw it. The best friend. You heard also from uh, that, that, you know, they were tiring of him. That they were sick of his obsessiveness with Emma. And the stories, the lies, and the kidnappings, and the, it's just too much to handle for, for uh, these guys. And we moved on to then the Maribel College folks, Max Siegel. Max Siegel, who endured the fake suicides, suicide attempts, and who, he who too said, I'm growing tired of him. I don't want this anymore. I'm a college kid. 
and who the defendant set up to be the last communication with Emma Walker. We think Max Siegel felt when he realized that he was the his phone was the last last voice communication with a dead 16 year old high school cheerleader from Central High School. And it was him who set him up for it. <coughs> and Mac was over it. And Walker Stanley, you know, Walker, country boy, got out of a tree stand to be interviewed by the police. He's putting hundreds of guns. Why would he ever talk about fingerprints on a gun? It just doesn't make sense. And then we went, moved into the police and the efforts of the police in this case to run down every angle, to interview every person, to check every story, because obviously you can tell in listening to Riley Gall that his lies have never been checked. He thinks that he can lie without a... He, he thinks he can just say something and, and that person told me and nobody's going to check. He thinks he's going to say actually say to Alan Merritt, uh, yeah, Walker Stanley told me that uh, he needed to find out how to clean prints off a gun. He thinks that, and that Alan Merritt's not going to follow up with Walker Stanley. Apparently, nobody has ever checked his lies. <laughs> because that's his modus operandi. That's how he operates. To just tell a lie. And even silly lies. I was a starter for the Maryville fo College football team. No, you weren't. Max Siegel said you played. As a freshman, you weren't a starter. Why? It just rules so natural. Why, why, why? And so when you think about the witnesses that you heard, the civilian witnesses, boy, it's awful easy to start to feel sorry for him. Nobody wanted him around. The walkers, her friends, his friends, his college buddies. Everybody in his life, in this trial, didn't want him around. And Emma Walker finally figured that out. And that's why she did. Because anything that he said in that interview with Alan Merritt was truthful. The only truthful thing was that she dumped him. And he didn't like it. And she probably said cruel things to him. Just like other people have. So it's probably easy for you to get in a mindset that you might feel sympathetic for him. But being pathetic, like you're going to see in the text messages, I'm begging, I'm begging, please, I love you, I'm begging, I'm begging. Being pathetic and not being wanted by anybody you're to have no sympathy. Just the law and the evidence in coming up with your verdict. <laughs> and so, <clears throat> as we look at the case, you have seven counts that are for your consideration. And the judge is going to explain to you when you, when you look at a count, uh, say a murder count, you're also going to, if you can't come to a complete verdict on that count, which, is, which I submit you, you're going to have, uh, this case is worthy of convicting him on every count of the lead charge. But the judge is going to say that if you don't come to a complete verdict, you have this verdict on a highest count, higher count, you go to the what are called lesser included offenses. You aren't going to make it to the lesser included offenses on most of these counts and all of these counts. But I think that the way that I want to discuss them with you is a little bit reversed. Not a little bit, a whole lot reversed. Only because your analysis, when you look at the facts and apply them to the law, are easier in the later counts and they get a little more complex in the beginning counts. So we'll start with count seven. And we talked about count seven being felony murder. And we talked about the concept in, the, in this case, and you'll see the judge is going to instruct you on the law that all the state has to prove is the predicate of felony offense. And once the predicate felony offense is proven, and, some, and we prove that somebody died, uh, that, that felony murder is proven. 
So your analysis in this case was, was shortened quite a bit when he pled guilty to shooting into an occupied dwelling. When you think about that, identity's gone. It was him. Uh, the fact that he fired into the dwelling is gone. He did it. He agrees he did it. The fact that a child was in that bedroom was gone when Jill Walker took the stand. And the fact that a killing occurred also was gone when Jill Walker took that stand. None of that is in controversy. There's nothing rebutting any of that. And so you think about the concept of taking a firearm and discharging the firearm into a child's bedroom while she sleeps. And folks, there's no other conclusion that you can come to, but that is the attempted aggravated child abuse, which is just simply that the defendant knowingly attempted to, other than by accident, he told you he did it, treat a child in a manner as to inflict injury. And that a deadly weapon was used to accomplish the act. We know all that, right? If he'd fired in through the window and shattered the glass and ricocheted and hit her, hit her, hit her and, and killed her, he still be felony murder. This count by the submission of him and the facts that you have is an easy count. He's guilty of felony murder. Count six is going to be employing a farm during the stalking, the especially aggravated stalking. So this count is really dependent on, on, on count two, and we'll talk a little bit more about count two. Uh, there's really no dispute. Uh, now, now that he pled guilty to count five, that he employed a firearm, uh, the question is whether it was in during that stalking, and we'll talk specifically about that in count two. Count five, firing into an occupied dwelling. Why did he, why did he plead guilty to that? If you think about why he pled guilty to employing a firearm, you've got to look back at the facts in the case and you think about the lies that he told, starting with Friday afternoon, telling Papa I don't know where the gun is, lying to Papa, lying to his mother, deceit, lies, participating in the search of his dorm room when he knew that he'd been staying over at Mac's room, right? You heard that. He wouldn't even stay in the room with Walker Stanley. If his mother had known that, his mother would have gone to, to Mac's room and might have found it. But he participated in that deception. Lies. That evening, he downloads a phony app to fake his phone number so that he can fake out Emma. Deception. Lies. He deceives Noah with a phone or app, trying to test it out. Deceives Emma. He deceives everybody at the party by saying he's been kidnapped. The prosecutor has to prove as that Mr. Willis intended it. Deception, lies. Lies about the kidnappers taking his phone, yet five minutes later he's calling Haley, and I say to Haley McDonald, why is it? I thought you told me that he said the kidnapper stole his phone. And her response was, exactly. Right? He lies about everything. He continues it with Noah, Isaac, and Alex. He tells them he's wandering down Taswell Pike, doesn't know where he is. Drop a pin and we'll find you. And they do. His buddies, they come to try and find him. And where's Riley? He's in his car. Even lied about that. Drives right by him. Pulls on in. And why is he lying? To add to possible suspects for what he's going to do. Because he's got a gun now. And he needs suspects to avoid responsibility. <clears throat> you think about avoidance of responsibility and how he tried to avoid responsibility, and it, and it was even in, in the questioning of, of his buddies. When you think about the, the cross-examination of Alex McCarty, wasn't that irresponsible of you to have not called the police or his mother or, his, or uh, somebody if he had a gun and you thought he was, might hurt himself? Wasn't that irresponsible of you? Remember that last question? Shifting responsibility away from the defendant and towards these buddies of his that they are somehow responsible for him creeping into her yard at 3 o'clock in the morning and discharging a firearm twice 
into her bedroom while she slept. They are responsible. That's almost like in Knoxville Police Department, can I help you? Hey, this is Alex McCarty, and my buddy Riley's not feeling good, and uh, he's, uh, you know, been talking about hurting themselves, and I think you guys just reopened the Gay Street Bridge, and I'm afraid he might draw off himself. Could you guys? No. No. You don't ask the city to close the Gay Street Bridge, because Riley is talking like he might hurt himself, and he might jump off the Gay Street Bridge. You can kill yourself in many ways. And don't push the responsibility of you creeping at 3 a.m. in the morning to these young men who came in and bravely, bravely talked to Alan Merritt and recovered that firearm for the citizens of this community and the family of the girl he killed. When you think about Saturday lives continued, I'm with Noah. No, you weren't with Noah. No, hadn't even woken up. You were gone. Haley gets the alibi. Breakfast with stepdad. We talked about that. Continued to lie. Uh, that he wasn't a man in black. Uh, and he lies to the police that he didn't show the gun to Alex. Why does he do that? He tells, he, he tells Alex that he got it for protection. What's the real reason he got it? What's the real reason he stole that gun since you now know that he faked the kidnapping story? The real reason is because he was going to use it against Emma. And he was faking and conjuring these outside forces to have somebody to blame it on when he did what he was going to do, which is hurt her. The violence that was ramping up that Isaac Ewer saw have been set in place, already set in motion. And Sunday, he lied to Noah saying he's going back to Maryville College because he had homework to do. I'd submit to you. Right after the gun was stolen, his room is searched. The only other logical place that gun could be is Matt's room. So why is it that he drove back from Knoxville to Maribel College and mysteriously went to Mac's room? And you remember how Mac described that to you? He had his own bedroom, but one of the roommates moved out. Riley kind of took that place over. He had his own privacy there. That's not something Mac would have known, that there was a gun in there. He lied to Mac. Created this story about my mom has my phone, so can you uh, lend me your phone so that he can then harass Emma Walker. He essentially lies to Emma. She get, he gets her on the phone for 14 minutes. You'll see that in Max Records. 14 minutes is the first call, and then he wears her out because she's cruel to him. But nonetheless, he uses Mac's phone to pretend to be Mac so she'd answer. And she did. Once. He lies to Mac and says, I'm heading back to my dorm. When he never makes it back to the dorm. You know, he comes up with this fantastic story to Alan Merritt. That I, I, I went back to my dorm and my roommate was on YouTube. And uh, he told me that that was all a lie. Walker Stanley told you that was all a lie. He never went back to his room. He immediately, after those phone calls were done with Max Siegel, between Max Siegel's phone and Emma Walker, where this defendant is continuing, I think 64 calls and texts. He makes a beeline to Knoxville. To Knoxville. Came back to Knoxville. Uh, and what does he tell the police? He lies to them about whether his roommate uh, had asked him to remove prints from a gun. That was all a lie. Whether or not his mama, and you heard the text communication, on his way to kill Emma Walker, he actually calls and texts his mother and says, did Papa find his gun? Set up. Complete setup. He'll have those text communications on his phone. He calls Noah, who he believes he trusts, 
The only people in this, if they had gone along with a murderous plot, if they'd have gone along with it, he might not have gotten caught. He voice calls him and asks him about the, the fingerprints on the gun. There's a distinction there. He leaves a trail with his mama about, did Papa find his gun? He's thinking. He's thinking about getting away with it. He lies to the police and, and creates this bogus reason. Why do you have to come back to Knoxville at 12 o'clock at night? Oh, I realized that I was logged in on my homework on Maryville. That's you heard from Jack Bittenbring, security at Maryville College. That's not true. It's a Google account. You log in, log out at will. You don't have to go back to the place where you were to log back in. Lies. And remember this, the biggest whopper of them all. He says, I went to Knoxville, logged myself out, my papa saw me. Oh no, he didn't. You heard from papa. Papa said he left at 8, eight or 9 that night and he never saw him again. My papa saw me, I had to log out, and then I drove back to Maribel and I was back on campus by 1 a.m. and then I wept because she was cruel to me for three hours in the parking lot in front of Cooper Athletic Center. And why does he come up with that? He comes up with that obviously to have an alibi because he knows he shot her at 3 a.m. And I don't know if any of you noticed this distinction when you, when you listen to the Fob, Key Fob video where he starts talking to his friends. Yeah, they said I went over there at 3 a.m. He uses the words 3 a.m. And you go back and listen to it. They said I went over there at 3 a.m. and shot her. And when you listen to the police interview, never was it said. Never once was it said that I went over there at 3 a.m. He knew that because he was there at 3 a.m. He told them he was back in Maribel. And why? Because he believed that that last call at 1229 to Noah was the last call he made. He didn't text. He didn't call after 1229. So it was easy breezy in his mind. I can throw that off. Get me an alibi. Pretend I'm back in Maryville when I'm, when I'm up there killing her. And I can blame it on the man in black. I can blame it on the kidnappers. And he did in that interview. <coughs> but what foiled him? What foiled him on his plan to have his alibi there at Cooper Athletic Center? Data. He didn't know that data collects cell tower information. He didn't know that his phone being on and apps connecting him to the, to the cell towers were going to create a trail. And so he lied based on his knowledge or belief that he was going to be only seen in Knoxville at that last call at 1229 when in fact he's collecting his taking phones, accessing the cell towers until 3, 345. Back in, back in Maryville at 419 a.m. Still in Knoxville at 345, didn't know that data was being collected on him. And so, he lied to David Wise, deny, 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 no knowledge of the gun, the man in black is responsible for this, continues to lie, giving back the gun to his papa. Remember that? When Alex McCarty says, I pull him to the driveway and I'm worried about him, I say, hey, what would you do with that gun? You have the other night, oh, I gave him back to my papa. Not even 60 seconds later, Ashley Donnellan comes out of the house and says, hey, uh, we need to find Papa's gun. And Alex McCarty's like, what? Something ain't right here. This is really bad at this point. Alex doesn't know she's been shot. You see that in his text communication. And when he finds that out, it all comes together for him. Lies. You saw the tweets in opening statement. <laughs> tweets out, rest sweet Emma. Tell, tell God about our verse. Love never fails. First Corinthians. What a phony, phony, nasty thing to do to that family. How could you do that? If you have no conscience, you could do that. 
So all of those things, the lies of making the efforts to throw the gun in the Tennessee River, to, to get with his buddies and, and, and get rid of the gloves, the clothes, the sweatpants, the sweatshirt, the latex gloves, all of those things, all those lies that he told are the reason why he pled guilty. He wanted to engender some sort of connection with you to, say, to gain some sort of credibility because he knew he would be destroyed in his credibility in this case. That's the only reason. <clears throat> Count four. He's charged with tampering with evidence, and you'll see it's undisputed that the firearm was evidence. You saw that in the statement. It's undisputed that he was confronted by Alan Merritt. Where's the gun? Where's your papa's gun? He reported it stolen. We may be able to match it up, and we may be able to look at the shell casings. It's undisputed he hid the weapon at Seth Donalon's house. You hear him go retrieve it. And it's undisputed that he's trying to get rid of it. Tampering with evidence. Count four. Count three, Jim Walker, gun missing. His value at 509, I know there's some cross-examination. Well, the value of the gun, the present value of the gun is 350, but I'd submit to you this. If Jim Walker were to put in an insurance claim on that, would he not put the receipt in? Would he not have to buy that? That's beyond the evidence in this case. That's beyond the evidence. Any insurance claims, any information like that? It's beyond the evidence in this case. That's a logical inference. But I'm just saying that the insurance claim and so, if the gun's value is $509, if you're going to replace the gun, you're going to buy it brand new, just like an unfired gun that Jim Walker told you was. And so, why is that value important? Because that's, that, that, that's a difference in valuation that you're going to have to set. If the gun was over $500, you're going to have one finding. If it's under $500, you are going to have another finding. And so we'd submit to you that the value of the gun and the receipt is solid and that you should find him guilty as charged in that count. In count two, we talked about a little bit about especially aggravated stalking. It's just a willful course of conduct. Repeated harassment of another individual that, caught, that would cause you to feel harassed, intimidated. You heard from her friends how she felt Friday. You heard through her texts and her friends how she felt Saturday. You heard from her mom and dad that she wanted the alarm turned on for the first time in her life. And here's why he doesn't want to admit to the man in black. When you read the course of conduct, it means a pattern of conduct composed of a series of two or more separate non-continuous acts. So if if you believe he's, the, he, he's involved in the kidnapping incident, that's one. And if you believe he's the man in the black, that's two. Non-continuous acts. Because you could argue, get up here and argue that when he came back to kill her, she didn't really know. So it's part of the continuous act of the stalking, but, is it, but it, does it fulfill uh, the fact that the person was actually harassed, uh, to, the person to feel that way? Was she, did she really feel harassed when she was killed? But if he fights and says, I'm not the man in black, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, then there's not two continuous acts, uh, Friday night and then Saturday morning as the state alleges. But folks, there's just an overwhelming amount of evidence to indicate he's both, and that he was harassing her. And that's especially aggravated stalking. And so that bootstraps you back to the employing the firearm, the employ a firearm on that third event, Sunday, early Sunday morning, and I'd submit to you, yes. So when you find that he's the man in black and you find that he is the kidnapper, then you'll find that he's the murderer, and you'll find him guilty of, of, of the employing <coughs> account as well. And finally, the probably, now this isn't a difficult count, uh, but the instructions are, are a little tenuous here that you have. Uh, to think about them and whether or not somebody, and this is always hard for a jury because you have to be in the mind of the person. You have to believe, and, and some of us want to resist that. You don't want to think that there are human beings out there that lack a conscience or that lack that could exercise reflection and judgment and, and intently intend to kill somebody. We want to reject that notion. 
It's just not something inside of good people to be able to, to, to think about. God, at least somebody really would, after thinking about it, at, with cool and deliberate purpose, after reflection and judgment, kill somebody. We want to resist that. So it's, that's why understanding the difficulty, why I want to address these in, in, in the reverse order. But that premeditated murder is one in which uh, we talked about at the beginning. If you, if you believe that, uh, that in the opening statement how counsel said he just wanted to get her back and he went over to scare her and, and whatnot, he's guilty of count seven. But if you believe that he went over there to kill her, he's also guilty of count one. And I would submit to you there is ample evidence in this record to indicate why he is guilty of premeditated murder. And so the distinction is, when you think about all the facts in the case, like uh, trying to get rid of the gun, secreting himself at night, all those types of things, they would, be, they would apply either way, whether or not he intended to go over there and kill her, or he went over there to scare the heck out of her and get her to run back in his arms, which is crazy, but we'll just go for that for a second, for sake of argument. Uh, he still want to get rid of the gun, right? He still want to uh, secret himself. He still want to run fast, all those things. So you have to distinguish what makes it in your minds, what makes this factually an intent to kill, as opposed to an intent to win her back, hurt her, possibly, and win her back. And just general premeditation, we, we know that it, it, we've already talked about he didn't intend on getting caught ever in this case. He did everything to try and, and, and make sure that he wasn't get caught. He created that, that weekend story to, to create a weekend of, of uh, getting her alone, trying to get her alone for the purpose of attacking her. He traveled 25 miles. In the middle of the night, he lessens his detection because he knew she'd be asleep, his parents would be asleep, her parents would be asleep. He dresses in black, latex gloves, taped his shoes. When you think about taping your shoes, why would you tape? Why would you put duct tape on your shoes other than create stability and traction and the fact that you're not going to lose your shoes when you're, when you're getting it? Especially when you, when you can uh, beat Max Siegel, a wide receiver for the Maryville College Scots in a foot race. He's got speed, and he wasn't going to lose them shoes or have lacking stability. Uh, that's why he taped his shoes. Calculated shot placement, fired twice, two different directions, hid the murder weapon, and went to sleep. All of those suggest premeditation. But here are the five reasons why he is guilty of murder and the intent to kill. And what shows you that this, that this trip from Maribel, the fact that he drove 25 miles alone in and of itself would suggest that he had cool and deliberate purpose. He had every chance to rethink what he was going to do and he declined. And so, the motive and the intent to kill. If you think about his statement, she was cruel to me, she said cruel things to me, she had finally broken it off with me, she, this, I knew this time was different, all of those things show you this was final for him. And all of the friends, the excessiveness, the manipulation, the control, all of those things add up to a complete and 100% motive to hurt her bad and kill her. All of those things. She was not going to not be with me, and she was not going to talk to me the way she was talking to me. And so he had that motive and that premeditation. And these are in order, I think, in order of the importance of why you can say there's an intent to kill here versus an intent to uh, hurt. Shot placement. When you think about the fact at 3 o'clock in the morning, dressed in black, he's standing outside a 16-year-old girl's bedroom, and you think of all the places he could have placed that shot. All the things that he could have done. I'll okay. Shoot up into the air, shoot in, the, shoot in through the window, anywhere, but where you shot? Shot placement. Show you an intent to kill. Proximity. 
How close was he up to that house 3 o'clock in the morning? You look at the shell casings, you heard from the investigator, you heard from Alan Merritt, that the shell casing will go back into the right. And so how close was he to that house to ensure penetration of that bullet and to ensure the, and to actually evidence his intent to kill? You look at that, you look at uh, uh, marker number three, the shell casing, he's right up on her. And you think about his knowledge and uh, whether or not uh, that bullet would penetrate. You know, you've heard what wall banging is, his favorite game, Call of Duty, you kill people through walls. Every person, if you put your mind to it and think about it, you know that when you shoot a gun, that it's going to go through things. That's why we have body armor. That's why we have the Pope Mobile. That's why we have the presidential limo. Can't tell you anybody with any common sense hasn't seen those things. Guns penetrate things. Everybody knows that. And he knows that. It's common sense. And his proximity to it ensured that deep penetration and intent to kill. And again, the proximity here, and I think we got this, this the placement uh, backwards. I believe number one is, the, is going to be the live round, and number two is going to be the spent shell casing. He's right up on the house, folks. But more importantly, number one, after he fires the first shot placement, and he jumps the fence, he then finds himself in a situation where he needs to correct that gun. That's the only logical explanation for why there's a live round seated there in marker number one. So he takes the time to do the mandatory necessary thing to get that next round. He is determined to intend to kill. And so that proximity of the next shot, again, repetition. The fact that he fired twice into this house, absolutely no questions asked, 100% shows you, intent to kill. He meant to finish the job. And as we said, he had to rack that slide to get him to the position where he could do that, where he could, where he could get up on it and repeat what he had just done. And look at the beautiful shot placement. Great work. I mean, if you intend to kill, that's exactly where you shoot. Anywhere else he could have shot. Anywhere. To evidence some other design than the intent to kill. And finally, you can see these lines. This is a little dark, but the... Um, You can see the lines here and here. You, you recall Bobby Jones, and this is, a, this is an exhibit that was put in through Bobby Jones showing the trajectory and the trajectories of these shots. This is a top view. You're actually looking down through the ceiling of the, of the residence, and her bed is right here. Her body is right here. Her head is right where those two, two trajectories cross. cross. And so, top view, ceiling hidden, this view convicts him. That's it. You don't have those trajectories without the intent to kill. And those five reasons are why this is distinguished in terms of an intent to kill versus some other bogus reason why he went over there. And so, when you think about all of the counts in the case, the seven counts that we talked about, in reverse order we talked about them, but you're gonna, you, can, you can look at them in any order you want. There is ample evidence in this record that this defendant committed all of those offenses. And you can run the table on him for this family. 
and convicted from every single count that he's charged because of his offensiveness, because of his lies, and what he's done to his family. This affront, not only in killing their daughter, but them going out to the community and posing like a poser, <coughs> like a liar. Please convict him. Thank you.